Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Um, we are about to get started. So I can have my video just for a second. Um, enjoy the beautiful view of my boiler in the background. You know, this is very important for every ITF meeting. Um, so, um, I'm Alexi, in case you don't know, uh, we have a new co-chair, Todd. Todd, can you show show your video so people can have a look? Um, right, so um, I'm, I'm mostly going to be driving slides. Um, Todd will present several issues um, as well. Um, Todd will keep a look for the queue for his discussions. Um, we have two hours today. Um, we'll use as much as, as as we can. If we get exhausted early, then we'll finish early. If not, we'll use the whole time. So thank you for coming. Let's get started. So um, I assume uh, most people are aware of the note well. Um, if you are not, please have a look and read the relevant documents about code of conduct and IPR related issues. Um, various RFCs with the link are listed here. So, um, you are in, assuming you are in a meeting, you are in the right place. Hopefully, um, Jabba room is integrated with uh, Meet Echo. Um, you don't need to um, go to Meet uh, to uh, CodeMD. Uh, so we, um, Bron has agreed to be our scribe. He will be taking note in CodeMD, which you can see the link here. Um, everybody is. Um, Attending the Meet Echo is uh, recorded automatically, so you don't need to go to meet to the CodeMD and add your name there. Um, and uh, this session is being recorded. Um, here's the agenda. Um, I reshuffled the tickets a little bit uh, because we had the recent uh, discussion about 452 versus 552, five, um, I moved it toward the end just because I think it might take a bit longer uh, because I would really like to get a few tickets done like Trace header fields or at least, you know, as done as we possibly can. Um, so let's get um, any agenda bashing. If not, let's get uh, started with the first ticket. So, um, Trace had a field definition. Um, this ticket is just summarizing problem statement. We have some definitions in 53, 22, and 21. Um, a lot of header fields were added in other RFCs and were described as trace header fields, uh, whatever it means. Um, so I think we uh, discussion on the mailing list is leading toward the way of um, making definition extensible. Um, so with this, I'm going to let Pete talk about his changes, which I split into. Uh, yeah, he uh, Pete did four slides for us, so I'll let him talk about this. And Pete is not here, is he?
He does not seem to be. Um, that is a bit of a pity, but let okay, let's try to to do this and see if he can join us. So um, there were sort of uh, four type of changes proposed. Uh, Pete suggested some text um, based on net feedbacks and um, Alessandro's and mine. Um, hopefully this part is going to be non-controversial. Net suggested to actually add a definition of what trace field is. Um, and this is in the new text, the trace field document actions taken as a message moves through the transport system. Um, and then the other part of the change is to clarify that um, although return path and receipt header fields are trace header fields, other specification can add to the list. Um, if people have an opinion, um, hopefully this is non-controversial, but let's, let's hear comments. Pete, Pete, you are here. You know, I, I figured it would be best to, you know, for everyone involved to shower and brush my hair before I got here, so. Well, that's fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yes, uh, this was already posted to the list. I guess my only question is, does someone? Does anybody here have issues with this particular part? This seemed like the non-controversial bit. I'm personally quite happy with it. Um, I think it would be nice to. Okay, John. This seems to put all the burden of defining this on the five three two one, which I. Yeah. Well. <laughs> <laughs> You didn't think there was a plan here? <laughs> <laughs> um, um, uh, works for me. It's uh, it's changing the balance between two documents, but I think it's probably the right thing to do. I mean, it, you know, this is actually more than it said in 5322, um, because that first line uh, wasn't even there. It basically totally pushed it off to fifty three twenty one. So um, it's uh, it's clearly better to have it in one place than this, and this is actually a compelling argument. That's the right place. So yes. Okay. Good. So next slide. Next slide. Next slide. Uh, oh yes. Okay. There we go. Sorry. Um, so in this one. Uh, I simply, at the top in the syntax portion, what, what describes the syntax, it adds the um, one or more receive fields or other fields indicated by optional field below that are defined by other specifications as belonging within the trace fields grouping. Again, no one on the list seemed to have a problem with this. There's the question of the actual syntax, um, and we'll get to that in a second, but the wording of this seemed relatively uncontroversial. Anybody want to say otherwise? Um, Good. You say yeah. Than the loan return path. Uh, I assume the change. If we agree that the loan return path is okay, then we'll change right. to yeah, yeah, yeah. The the change to here is is you know simple. I, I just um, I wanted to make sure that the general structure of this was okay with folks. Okay, now let's get on to the nitty gritty, which is the syntax itself. Um, so next slide. Okay. Um, so currently in three six seven, we've got an optional return path followed by one or more received. And so what I put into the, um, the proposal on the list was optional return path followed by 
one or more either received or optional fields. And then the question of what about a loan return path? Can you do that? Um, and so I wrote up some syntax to accomplish that that says, OK, well, you can either have a loan return path or an optional return path in one or more um, received or optional fields. Uh, I don't know how people feel about this. What it, you know, go ahead, John. Um, oh, look, it works. Um, I think on the mailing list, I was I was pushing for uh, your 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 option with no received fields at all. But actually, I, I poked around. As far as I can tell, in the existing practice, anything that anything that adds a return path. Um, we'll add at least one received, even if it's injected internally. So I think your your original proposal with at least one actually match, matches reality, and it's somewhat and it avoids weird situations where you have a, where you have a received block that contains nothing at all. So, go ahead. I, I, oh, oh no, I, that was just me echoing. Um, Alexi. Um. I'm trying to channel Matt here because he's not here, unfortunately. Um, and I think, yes, when we are talking, if we are talking about message created post delivery, this is going to be true. Fortunately, unfortunately, various other types of software will strip received. Uh, so I think we need to accommodate that because the, um, this spec, Nat's argument is that this spec is more generic than just for SMTP, so which I tend to agree. Right, and I was gonna look beforehand and, um, and let me take a quick look here. Uh, yeah, so I mean, one possible, um, avoidance of the issue is simply to say, look, we've got these nice, you know, obs fields, the, the obsolete syntax, the read only syntax. Um, does that satisfy this particular problem? I um, don't think it's a question of being obsolete, though. It's not, but there's lots of things in obsolete which are, well, we accept that such things exist in the universe, um, but you shouldn't send them on the wire. And now, uh, what Ned's talking about is in an IMAP context, um, which is wire. So I, I don't know that it really satisfies that. Um, and I, yeah, I'm not I, I, I'm a few... reference, I'm a referencing this document. So with right. the exception of saying, you know, when you create draft messages, which might have missing fields, everything. Otherwise, it complies, right? Right. Um, it, uh, assuming that John and Alexi just haven't lowered their hands yet, Dave, did you want to hop in here? Um, so uh, what what I think I heard you describing is imposing a requirement for fields that have not been required in the past and for which, even though there's a practice that might match that requirement, um, there's no operational need to impose the requirement. So demanding that there be uh, trace fields doesn't make a lot of sense to me in the absence of a compelling operational requirement for that. Similarly, um, putting things in OBS field, I, I, I don't understand the utility of OBS field. I understand the intent behind creating it, but in terms of real world effect, Put, putting something there with the belief that it, it means something doesn't match what I think has been demonstrated reality. Yeah, um, well, what do I want to say? I, I, I apologize. On I'm on mute. I don't appear to be. Oh, maybe. Are, can you hear me now? Oh, the system is no. more intelligent than any of us expected. Yeah, I can hear well, you. I can hear okay. you both. Um, um, so in any event, I I, um, I apologize. Oh, it's only me that can hear it. Wow, it's really intelligent. Yeah. 
Um, I, I hereby apologize for my uh, uh, 20 year less uh, so. age self. Um, yeah, the, the OBS field thing, had we had to do it over again, we might have had a different discussion because um, I hate it now myself. But um, so, Dave, can you hear me? No, now I can't hear Dave. That's kind of fun. I think Dave is having audio problems. I can, can hear, hear you me. now. It's interesting, Nitico has a reconnect audio button, which suggests this is a common problem. So I didn't yeah. hear much of what you said, except right at the so, end. I, I, I apologize for um, my 20 year less age ago self. Um, uh, yeah, the OBS fields, uh, I, if we had to do it over again, I'd have argued differently. Um, they, they were meant to be, you're going to have to deal with messages that have these things. Um, and so for parsing purposes, um, you might look at the OBS fields to explain how to parse what might otherwise look horrible from the um the the, the true and um you know correct fields in section three I, I yeah um for whatever that's worth um the 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 audio issue i was having i think i've now figured out and it's bizarre if the microphone is on uh so i can talk like i'm talking now then I can't hear you, probably anyone else talking, and I have to go on mute in order to hear you, which is really interesting. Um, I mean, at one level, I like that idea, but it's not actually conducive to conversation. At any rate, um, what you've just done is describe an interesting idea for the OBS field, but it, again, has nothing to do with actual practice. And so uh, imposing a, a theory of its use um, is an interesting academic exercise, but doesn't have much to do with the real world. And I'd advise against uh, our being clever that way. Um, right. I, I, I don't disagree with you. And it, like I said, in this particular case, you know, Ned's talking about, well, I'm on this IMAP server, I'm creating a message or I'm, you know, um, um, somehow editing a message to add this stuff that is currently not acceptable in the syntax. So uh, it does seem like m maybe we should make a change somehow. Um, anybody else on this? I, I mean, jo John um, Levine's the, comment was, the more I'm sorry. Effort it takes to deal with the trace field, the more it raises the question of why it's worthy of this energy given that there was no concern about the trace field until the delivered to stuff came up. And um, the nature of this working group is to fix significant problems. Now, again, in the abstract, I get what's driving this because there's inconsistencies, et cetera, and, but there hasn't been an operational problem that this is solving. There's an intellectual problem it's solving. There's a formal specification problem it's solving. And again, that, that, at that level, that makes sense. But in terms of what the scope and intent of this working group is, I don't get it. Uh, so go ahead, Alexi, but I, I'll, I'll have a comment on that. D Dave, uh, I think the issue is that basically existing practices didn't match the document. So the document needs to be fixed. examples of existing practice problems so i apologize for that uh, so the, the authentication the results and uh i defined one uh had a um had a field i think x400 has also received type had a field uh so but but the practice the the they the practice that dave was referring to is that they get treated like other trace fields yes. by, in certain circumstances, stripping them out, in certain circumstances, using it to trace the message, that they, in fact, do get treated like these fields, but they were never allowed in that block before, which is why you introduce optional field into the trace element itself, because then you can say, and, and they've been labeled in other documents as 
trace in order to indicate you want to be able to strip these out in other cases where you would strip out trace fields. And so you want to indicate in the document, these are permissible in a block of trace fields. And then the issue came up, okay, well, so, if you can do that, you might want to do something else. Again, as a construct, that sounds great. What, what, and, and, and were the goal to produce a much, much cleaner version of these specifications, that'd be great. Uh, I didn't understand that to be the goal of this working group. I thought the goal of this grouping was dramatically more narrow. And so for uh, all that you've just said and described, um, I don't believe it's actually had operational uh, problems that it's caused. It's causing problems in uh, one's desire for clarity and consistency and purity about uh, the term trace field. I get that. Uh, but nothing that I know of that actually has affected operations or implementations. Bron? This question the other way around um, and ask, I guess, to Dave. If we did define this in this way, would that affect operations either? Uh, if, if we tidy this document up more than, more than strictly necessary, does that cause problems? I, I predict that it, it would constitute doing something outside of the scope of this working group. One can imagine a working group that has the goal that you just described, perfectly great goal, but doesn't match what I thought the goal of this working group was, which was really severely constrained. Yeah, that's not the question I asked. Um, the question I asked was, if we did this, would it cause operational problems? Uh, would it cause... Uh, communication and, problems would it cause and, any and, problems uh, other than my comment is discussion. that's a really great question for uh, a, a working group with a larger scope and the problem with the question you asked is not that it's an unreasonable question it's a perfectly fine question but how is it in the scope of this group i'm struggling to understand um, what your motivation is for questioning it because you haven't answered my question twice now. Um, and you, sorry, I can't hear you. So I'm questioning the question. The reason I'm not answering it is because wh why is the question appropriate for this group is what I'm asking. Um, all right, Barry, who's our area director, and Murray, who's also an area director, are both in the queue here. So maybe they can have some comments on the scope question. I'll pop off. Well, I'll jump in. I, I, I think Dave is correct. Um, we made the scope of this very narrow on purpose, uh, and there are good reasons that we did that. So yes, let's be careful about making changes that aren't really necessary. Um, so I think I agree with Dave that we, we're better off minimizing the change in this area. Because I, I think the answer is that no, we're, we're not affecting we're not doing something that's affecting operations. So let's, um, let's try to keep this part simple. I don't actually agree with no affecting operations because what people use existing trace like header fields for is not agreeing with the current spec because of expectations of ML systems, basically. So this is aligning existing practice with what the documents are saying. Well, so I think, the, the, right, the issue here is you, uh, um, an IMAP, uh, uh, IMAP creates a message. It hasn't gone anywhere yet, so it has no trace fields. And according to this, it's strictly speaking invalid. I, no, well, I don't so, think anybody so, uh, let, let's, let's back up a second. Um, if it hasn't recorded any trace fields, no return path, no receive fields, no optional fields up at the top, it's perfectly valid because it, it, the in section, the top of section 3.6, the entire trace block is optional, right? There are two things being done that we're discussing here. One is whether a return path alone in a trace block is a reasonable thing to do, 
without any other received or optional fields. Right. And whether that should be made um, legitimate. And then there's a, a separate question um, uh, coming up. Oh, well, and then there's the separate question about whether optional fields need to be expressed as part of the trace block because of these other uses of the word trace in other documents, or is it okay for them just to float freely in the top of the message? Right, and, and up, up until now, some have floated freely in the message, correct? Well, but uh, that's that was going to be my next set of questions on the next slide is, okay. is it, slide. yeah, but, but I, I mean, that's a good question. Are there, are there things up free in the top of the message that are not part of the trace block is, you know, a, a, another separate question. Okay, and, right. and I guess what, what Dave is suggesting and what I'm agreeing with is that uh, that they have floated and that that has not caused problems in the past. Let's not try to fix that now. And I guess that part is not being said as an AD. Uh, the let's keep it as simple as we can is the AD pronouncement. The rest is my opinion. I'll let you run the queue, Alexi. <laughs> uh, Bron, do you still want to talk? No. John? Th this the path we're going down is making me a little nervous because it seems to say that if something was not in 5322, but people have been doing it anyway, they or it is not only okay, but it's okay not to say anything about it. And that is inconsistent with the definition of a uh, of a internet standard because the internet standard is supposed to reflect reality. And uh, and the fact that in the last decade or so things have started getting done which we haven't paid any attention to and that have not caused uh, 5322 to, to, to collapse into disrepute uh, does, is, doesn't align with that. Uh, so I, I think I'm okay with this either way, but, uh, but the argument that it, uh, it wasn't in 5322 and, uh, and people have been doing it and, uh, and therefore we don't need to reflect it now in any way at all uh, seems to me to be uh, putting us on a slippery slope. And since some of these things which have been done and haven't put work, work in 5322, uh, use the term trace field explicitly um, and, uh, and are on the standards track, uh, it seems to me that we're creating some nasty spaghetti threading and, uh, uh, and, and really ignoring what the uh, the goal of an internet standard is supposed to be. And if the scope of this working group is defined as do things which are not consistent with what an internet standard is supposed to be about, then, then, then we're in serious trouble. So I'm not, I'm not certain we're there, but it feels like the scope is feeling very slippery at the moment. Right. I, I, I sort of uh, share John's concern. I think uh, if it doesn't reflect reality, I believe we need to fix it. Um, can I just attempt last go at missing uh, received header field, and then we can move on to the next slide, which is uh, we already started discussing. In yeah, the... let, let's, yeah let, let's do the next slide, because that might also change people's opinions about this. Uh, I don't know. Let's see. Can I just quickly, so uh, we were talking, we were concentrating on IMAP, but actually IMAP is no, not the only thing that does this. Um, in IMAP case, we potentially can fix it in other ways. Um, consider mail filters or, you know, I'm um, very, uh, What's the word? Um, 
basically system that strips uh, received header fields uh, on leaving the main for security reasons. This happens all the time to hide internal um, inter information about internal network. So let, I let's think see, this is another the, case. The, the Milters question, which was Alessandro's point, let's leave aside for a second. Let me ask about the the stripping case. Um, are they stripping and not stripping return paths? Or are they just they're they're stripping everything and the the issue you're pointing out is um, they want to be able to strip like authentication results, but um, don't have any syntactic justification to do that because it's not in the trace block. That I don't know whether they strip both or just uh, just received. Bron, did you have a, an opinion on this? Opinion as a software author and per person who works with many software authors, the chances are they strip an arbitrary set of headers that have been encoded into a re regular expression somewhere, um, where they get the definition of what should be in that regular expression is 90% just looking at a few emails that went through their system and 10% looking at our documents. <laughs> and hopefully at least that 10% gives them something that is actionable. Right. Right, 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 right. All right, John, and let's move on to the next slide. I think John was a ghost of a previous hand in the air. All right. He's, he's a ghost. Okay. Fine. So, um, I'm not entirely sure whether we are uh, where we are between proposal on the list and possible proposal at the bottom. Um, I think we probably need to take this to the mailing list still. Is this fair? Yeah. I, I, I think at least we have to take this to the mailing list unless something in the next slide makes people look back at this and go, oh, well, if that's true, then then it's obvious what we need to do. But I don't think okay. it's going to happen. <laughs> Fine. OK, so um, currently in uh, 3.6, that's what the top looks like. So you've got an optional field. At, so uh, let's start with the top. There is an optional block of stuff that is either trace, optional fields, or recent blocks, right? And that's at the top. And then what follows that is a, an optional block um, and, uh, of as many as you like, the rest of the header fields, date from sender, blah, 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 blah. There's also an optional field in that block, just in case you want to add different kinds of fields in the, in the ladder. But that's the way it looks, okay? So you've got the header block, which is trace, optional, or recent, and then you've got the rest of the headers, again, as many times as you want, which are the standard headers plus optional field. Okay, next. Uh, there is no more slides from you. This is the slide. Uh, oh, the, you truncated the, oh, really? Bummer. Sorry, um, it, it, so, it, it was just too small to, uh, to Right, show. right, 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 right. No, that's okay. Um, yep. So the proposal that um, I made, I think on the list, was if optional field is going to be in trace anyway, do we need it separately as an optional field in the whole top of the header fields where trace, recent, and other things can go? Or is every additional field that will appear in that block in the top of it, in the top of a header block, um, going to be either trace, which includes optional, or the recent fields? Because then we could get rid of one occurrence of the optional field, which to me seems 
like a good cleanup. Optional field was added to 5322 from 2822 when someone realized that you couldn't put authentication results at the top of the message, which everybody agreed was a, a, a screw up. Um, any strong feelings about this? So, um, sorry, if I can jump the queue. Uh, for me, the question the is, here. can uh, non-trace header fields be inserted at the top? Do we have examples right. of this? And the answer is, I, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't know either. Because um, the side effect of removing this is then disallow disallowing them if they already existed um and that's what i suppose right. it's hard to prove um john um i have not fully thought this out so this is a is a snap <laughs> reaction i may regret but if your intent per earlier conversation is to put the actual definition of most or all of these trace fields into uh, 5321, then the optionality is going to have to be, then it has to be optionality there, regardless of what additional optionality 5322 uh, provides, because there might very well be transport level optionality as well as um, uh, post delivery header optionality. So, my gut is telling me that while this looks like a simplification, while taking that out would be a feels like a simplification, it actually isn't, especially if we're going to switch all, all of the semantics and some of the syntax into 5321. Fair enough. Ron? Again, I could be persuaded I'm wrong, but that's my gut reaction. Uh, I, again, I'm coming from implementation experience here, looking at what Cyrus IMAP does and what my Civ script does that puts a little header in that I just randomly added to stuff. And the edit header extension just pops new headers at the top regardless of anything. There's no smart regardless which of header is which semantics. or what order they're in. I have worked with systems that reorder headers in all sorts of different ways as the messages go through. Um, if you're really lucky, at least I'll keep the received headers in the same order. So headers with the same name won't get sorted internally as well. But you know, all bets are off. They could very well have been thrown into a hashing algorithm that just spits them out in whatever order it spits them out. Um, so anything that puts explicit ordering on which headers are allowed above or below any other headers is going to run into difficulties. And I'm wondering why we have any ordering requirement at all, um, given that um, it doesn't seem to be an operational problem. I mean, there there is already, and note here that this the, the syntax that was in 5322 does impose an ordering which probably is um, at least dodgy with regard to reality, which is that all of the recent and all of the trace fields need to be above from sender ori origination date, everything else. Um, but there's an explicit warning in 5322 which says these things can be reordered and you should try and keep them in these blocks so that people can follow the path of, of transport, but um, you, you can't depend on that. Um, so, yeah, for whatever, for whatever it's worth. Um, yeah, as a participant, I think I would rather leave optional field here and just for the reasons that Braun and, and John stated and just let this section be as is. I think uh, it feels like this also will uh, um, make Alessandro happy. Yes, I think so. Too. Um, okay, so in that case, we, we are really for issue number seven, we're strictly talking about 367 and whether trace itself should be defined as allowing fields other than return path and received. 
and um, whether the syntax should allow for a return path with no received or other fields next to it. And I don't think we've got consensus from what folks have been saying on the I think we do have consensus that we want extensibility. We don't have com consensus about optional received. Well, but it, it extensibility, pure extensibility, you could do in, oh, uh, about optional received. Um, right. So I think because, your text is right, uh, but the A, B, and F is still in question, basically. OK. Yeah, the, the way um, the way the syntax in 3.6 appears, if you have recent or if you have some optional field at the top, um, then you must have at least one received field, which may be not what we want. As a proposal to get uh, moving on this specific issue, maybe we can do a short um, poll on the mailing list where the people know whether it's just received in strip, both returned back and received. And maybe pe people like Nat have specific knowledge about this. Or we can find people who can help us. OK. I'm willing to hold in my holding pattern and wait for the list. That's all I got. So, um, I think there are a couple of related issues in 5321. Uh, I don't think at this point we have specific suggestions for change. Um, the only uh, related issue is going to be on the following slide is about the registry. Um, for trace header fields. Um, and proposal for this is to have it in the applicability statement document. So, John, if you want to say anything about trace header fields and 5321 BIS now. Um, again, I. I... I'm going to need to think about this, but my snap reaction is that if the uh, if the trace header fields uh, plus or minus optional are uh, <clears throat> are going to be shifted in five three two one in terms of precise definition and semantics, then I think the registry definition has to at least be mentioned there. Probably that particular if if the, if we're keeping a separate trace field registry. Then that should probably be defined in 5321 rather than 5322. But again, that, that's more uh, more instinct than anything I've spent time thinking about. So so do you prefer for uh, the registry to be defined in 5321 or applicability statement? Uh, my instinct right now would be to define it in one. And uh, and then mention it in five three two two if uh, if if that seems to be appropriate as, as Peter Volt's text, but I don't feel really strongly about it yet. Okay, fine. So moving on to the specific text about. Uh, registry. This is ticket number eight. Um, a few months ago, I proposed uh, initial text, and there were various changes suggested. So let me talk about this. Uh, um, the current text, uh, proposed text on the slide, suggests updated version, modular the issue at the end about uh, registration procedure. So um, 
Iana is requested to create a new sub-registry for email header fields that can be added to a message header section by MSA MTA MDA. Um, the new sub-registry would show whether header fields can be added by message submission relay or delivery system or some combination of them. So they're basically various columns uh, in the registry. Um, this uh, definition got expanded initially. I think it was just relay delivery and then uh, people asked what about submission. So they seem to be support for mentioning submission here. Um, that uh, The next change is um, earlier version was saying that header fields in this registry must be registered in the header fields registry, whether permanent or provisional. Um, the current proposal is to have it as a should. Um, re, um, feedback received on the mailing list was that, uh, well, various implementations have their own um, header fields. They don't necessarily want to be forced to register in, in in the main registry, um, but I think it's still a good idea. So hopefully, should will um, keep people happy with um, their own X dash version of header fields. Um, and then the final question is registration procedure for this. Um, initial proposal said expert review. Um, again, there was some pushback saying, well. Um, what if I want to register my own propri proprietary header field and then uh, can the experts say no? And um, possible proposal is first come first serve. However, in this case, the question is, if somebody register, registers uh, a header fields in this registry already defined in RFC and register it incorrectly, um, how we are going to handle this. Um, comments, suggestions? John? John. John, we don't hear you. I think this is fine. I think expert review makes sense so long as we understand that the goal, that, that the expert's job is just to, to weed out stuff that seems um, obviously wrong. You know, if I if I if, if, if I'm you know if I'm registering content type as, as as a as as a trace header, perhaps the expert could push back on that. And I also wondering, you know, my, my wearing my database hat. I'm wondering whether this would make more sense as, as another column in the main in the main table rather than as a separate table that we're trying to keep keep in sync. But I see the point that people might want to register their private things so they don't so they don't have to stay in sync. So basically, I think as proposed, it looks okay. Okay, thank you. Okay, if um, people don't have any comments on this one, let's move on. Seems like we're getting some kind of uh, closure on this one. So I'll propose latest text on the mailing list and uh, hopefully we can close this ticket. Right, now we are coming up with I the fun section. No, but nobody called on me, so let me jump in. Um, I strongly suggest when you propose that text that you make sure you put in text uh, with instructions to the expert reviewer along the lines that uh, of what John said. Yeah, I believe so. That that's a part that was missing. Saying you know you don't want to. If somebody puts subject or content type there, you know there is a ground to to re refuse uh, registration. But other than that, yeah, just register yep. basically. Yep. Yeah. Great. So um, now we are starting with the fun section about eHello. Everybody get your coffee. Um, 
so um, this ticket number 19 is about two sentences um, talking about the hello and checking uh, the main name against the corresponding IP address. Um, on this slide, we are talking about the first sentence, which is in bold. As an SMTP server may verify the domain name argument in the e hello command actually corresponds to the IP address of the client. Um, and the proposal is an SMTP server may verify that the domain name argument in the e hello command has an address record matching the IP address of the client. Um, just small possible clarification to this. Do we want to be more specific about what address record is? Do we mean A or AAA? Um, so what do people think about this change? Barry? Um, as a participant, not as AD, um, yeah, I like the change that's proposed. I would also add the word alone to the end of the second sentence in that paragraph. Um, Must not this refuse. This is the next slide, the so let's wait. So, uh, okay. Let's talk uh, then, about uh, second. No on the next slide. Yeah, oh, that's fine. I'm, I'm happy with that change. And I don't know that we need to clarify what address record is. I think it's OK the way it is. John? I think I, think I agree with Barry. I'm, uh, I'm not certain that I see in uh, either case the necessity for doing this but i don't think it makes things any worse it might, might make it a little better and uh uh the dress record was deliberately left uh a little vague in uh uh in 2821 and 5321 um because we were slightly concerned that uh that ipv6 might implode and we might end up with IPv something or else at some stage, uh, and uh, and I think it's probably wise to uh, to preserve that uh, uh, that flexibility unless there's compelling reason for saying it's got to be one of these two. Right. Uh, I think uh, my uh, gut reaction was like. Do we want to make sure that people don't do something silly like I don't know IMAX? But yeah, fine. All right, uh, Bron. Most of what I want to say has already been said by the previous two people. I mean, this is basically no op. It's a, they may verify. Um, an SMTV server may do whatever the hell it likes. You connect to it, it decides whether it wants to talk to you or not and, and tells you to go away for whatever reason. Um, this is really just telling people this is a thing that SMTP servers are likely more, more likely than not to do. Um, so making it as uh, this, this is a thing that is good to do is pretty much what you're saying to people reading this because SMTP servers are likely to treat you differently based on it. Right. John? Bronze, Bronze, right. And, uh, and as I'm remembering this, the main reason for the first sentence there, in either the old form or the new form, the main reason for the first sentence there is to provide an introduction to the second sentence, which is the prohibition against doing anything if you decide to, if you find an IP address and decide you don't like it. Right. Okay. And of course, Fine. that probably is slightly overridden by the operational necessity clause, but that's another problem or issue or something. Okay, uh, so um, this particular change seems non-controversial. So let's move on to the next slide, which is slightly more controversial.
So, in regards to the second sentence, um, I think basically various people uh, observe that must not just does not reflect reality, that uh, a lot of implementations check that in violation of, of this. Uh, and actually, uh, Sam pointed out that some servers uh, have option whether to check this or not, configuration option, and yeah, this is very true. We have it in our own implementation, for example. Um, so suggestion is to change must not to should not um, and add explanation, probably an applicability statement document about dangers of this and why should not specifically. All right, Barry? Yeah, so here's where we get uh, my thing. I, I agree with uh, should not. And I would add either the word solely af uh, after the word message or alone at the end of the sentence to give an indication that uh, they can certainly use the, that information as part of a decision, but it shouldn't be the only basis for the decision. All right, Todd? I, I disagree. I think it, it should be a, a sole basis for the decision uh, and just based on established anti-abuse practice if a host hellos as you know say mail.google.com but they're they're coming from some random consumer space in Romania or whatever um, that's that's enough right there to, to reject the connection if you haven't already blocked it just based on the source IP I mean, you clearly have you, you clearly have a client at that point that is trying to um, is at best misconfigured and at worst is is trying to abuse your system and that's enough to just shut down the connection right there and send it on its merry way so then then you're advocating not for should not but for may yes I'm advocating for may okay okay Ron? for something else entirely which is just cut this it adds nothing it means nothing just cut the whole the whole paragraph don't don't make any statement about what the server should may maybe could do the server will do what it will do yeah, we don't need to say what it may or may not do put it in the applicability statement how punt it to that yeah, potentially put in the applicability statement, put in, in some kind of best practices thing, but it doesn't need to have any normative statement about what the server will do. Just this this is a thing it's likely to look at. Please make sure you minute your proposal in your notes. John? Yeah, I think Ron just anticipated my comment. If we're, if we're good, I, 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 I'm vaguely in favor of should with the changes the change that Barry suggested. But if we're going to move this to um, uh, the server, may look at this, and if it does look at this, it may do something about it. Then I think the whole then I think that's justification of the whole paragraph being taken out uh, because it just doesn't have any meaning at that stage. Servers may look at whatever, but ser servers may look at whatever they feel like looking at without our having to say anything. And uh, and you know, if they look at it, they may pay attention to it, and they may not. So. Uh, so, so e moving e this to applicability e statement, should, right? Should we take the paragraph out? Okay. Are, are you happy with uh, some text and applicability statement about this? Sorry, I couldn't hear you. Are you happy with some text in the applicability statement uh, about verifying? Oh, hello? absolutely. Fine. Thank you, Pete. I just wanted to point out that Todd's example isn't actually a problem for the original intent of this sentence, because this was simply if the IP address and the name do not match in the DNS, that alone is not sufficient for the server to punt it. The example Todd gave was they didn't match and I have this information that they 
don't match, that this is an IP address somewhere in Romania, and that is Google's domain name, right? That additional piece of information is not, it's not the case that Google forgot to register this name, this, this number to go with this name. It's that there was a simple non-match. Now, I think, you know, uh, this is perfectly reasonable to pull and put in the applicability statement, but there's not enough in this sentence as currently construed to really explain that the issue here was don't just assume that the DNS is correct about names and numbers. Uh, assume that you might be missing a separate piece of information. Um, so, but putting this in the AS and doing a fuller explanation is perfectly reasonable. Fine. Uh, I'll let Todd respond to you in case he wants to uh, respond directly. Todd? Yeah, I, I, I must have misstated something because I, I don't understand Pete's interpretation of, of what I said. Um, it, I wasn't relying on additional information there. I was saying you helloed as this name. I looked up that name in the DNS and that does not match the IP address from which you have connected. Therefore, I will drop this connection. But Romania was just a random example I threw out there. It could have been any consumer network or any network anywhere. Um, but it was strictly on, you gave me a name. I looked up the name in the DNS. I did not get back an IP address that matches where you're coming from. So goodbye. Right. Harold? Just uh, please don't use mail.google.com as an example. If you start making domains for mail.google.com, you will find that it's, there's nothing even remotely like a, a simple reverse lookup. Now, the name that Google uses in eHello is, in fact, something that may, maps back, but that's probably because uh, it spends significant time fighting with people with with uh, misguided uh, spam scripts. I think uh, tossing solely because of a mismatch here is inviting issues. So no, don't don't uh, remove. So keep it at least should not. At least should not. All right, Dave. So let's see if my headset will make this work better for audio. Um, so Peter Koch uh, posted a quick squib in the middle of the postings I was doing. I didn't quite understand what he was referring to at the time. And in listening to the exchange that's been going on just now, <clears throat> whether it's what he meant or not, I think it applies. What he wrote was, I'd suggest this confuses protocol and policy. Um, the reality is that email operations is, has become complicated and varies over time. And that the nature of what you're talking about right now gets into the realm of things that change over time and are not essential to the protocol specification, but to the varying demands of operations. Um, and consequently, uh, 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 considering uh, taking actions like removing these sorts of statements that will prove to be wrong over time, uh, because they're not essential to the protocol, they're essential to operations, which is different, it is something that would be worth considering since it simplifies the document quite a lot. Now the question is whether I will actually hear anybody. Uh, well, I, I heard you, so hopefully you hear me. So thank you. I do. Right. OK, so basically uh, remove this text. That's what you suggest from this document and move it to yes. Uh, I, I think so. And, and uh, I, I was long winded about it because it's a philosophy to doing editing on the document that will likely be very helpful in other places. Yeah, fair enough. Right, Braun, you have the last comment on this. 
that was pretty much entirely covered uh, by what Dave just said there. And yes, that that is that is the core point. And thank you, Peter, for noticing that that it is policy rather than protocol. Um, the behaviour of the survey when verifying things and deciding whether they are valid or invalid is entirely policy. And it is a good point that we should be trying to remove policy as much as possible from the protocol definition uh, because it doesn't belong here. And on, on that grounds, I say still, yes, we should remove it. There's no point putting stuff in, a, in our protocol that we know people aren't going to follow. Um, and to leave it in there, even with a should, is we know that people are not going to follow that should and they're not even going to want to follow that should because it's such a good signal for anti-spam in current year still and has been for the entire time I've been doing email. Okay, thank you, Bron. Um, I think I'm hearing that uh, obviously subject to verification on the mailing list, people suggest to remove the, the whole paragraph and possibly add something along these lines with should not uh, or maybe even more exp uh, an even more expanded version into the applicability statement. So I think the um, direction for 53.21 seems clearer, and then we'll follow up on the mailing list and discuss what to do with applicability statement. Okay. Moving on. This is ticket number one about use of IP addresses in eHello. Um, we had various discussion on this. People, uh, some people say that it should be syntactically uh, invalid and deprecated, and other, uh, in particular for IoT cases, think that it should be still allowed and sounds like we need at, at minimum some text in applicability statement about this. So, comments please. Pete? I'll try and channel Keith since he's not here for the moment and say syntactically it seems reasonable to leave it in even though uh, hearkening back to our last discussion, by policy, it might be quite reasonable to reject a whole bunch of these things. Um, but there are IoT cases, there are other cases where you want to say, by policy, I'm going to allow an IP address literal because this is a space where I really can't use domain names in a legitimate way. Um, so I think protocol-wise, it's okay to leave it in and um, policy wise, it's okay to say, nope, not accepting those. Okay, thank you. John? Take that a little further. Uh, I'm, I'm seeing, uh, still seeing a number of, uh, of SMTP clients that, uh, that we describe as IoT devices today, but uh, but were designed to build long before the term IoT came into fashion, and some of which are, are pretty big objects, uh, using IP addresses because they are uh, using SMTP to send uh, um, messages of one sort or another to uh, local servers um, uh, and, and don't have access to DNS and don't even speak DNS. Um, and uh, and before those things get to the get past the the the, the relay the first relay uh, they're using the relay's domain name so they're not showing up on the public internet they're showing up in LAN and land like and isolated network like environments uh, but they're using IP addresses because they don't have any choice and uh, and that's of course the reason why we retained IP addresses into 2821, because we had a piece of this discussion back at that point. So uh, um, uh, anything in the AS which says that IP addresses in the public internet are probably a bad idea, I think is fine. But as far as 5321 is concerned, I don't think it's healthy to make a change. Okay, sounds good. Any other comments?
So looks like uh, with this ticket, we have no change for 5321 bis and uh, various text suggested for, for the applicability statement and we'll discuss it on the mailing list. Okay, next ticket, quoted strings and escaping. Uh, John, would you like to present this or would you like me to talk about this? I, uh, I guess I'll say some things about it. Um, um, I've, uh, <clears throat> I've seen implementations in which all of these things are considered equivalent. I've seen implementations in which they're not. Uh, this, uh, this interacts with the 5322 question about, uh, about quoted strings, although uh, that particular question is much narrower than this. And, uh, and I think there's an argument for figuring out what it is we meant in narrowing it down. Uh, even if we end up saying that, um, uh, that, um, uh, there's some legacy things out here and, uh, and servers better be prepared for them. Uh, I think the, uh, the combination of operational experience and, uh, and an argument for clarity are used for uh, for looking at this again. In the most extreme case, uh, we may want to start deprecating some of these combinations because uh, they just cause confusion. The other part of the story here is we've got a history of uh, of operating systems getting hold of these things after the users put them in and deciding that some quote characters but not others are the uh, are the property of the operating system designating local symbols and things like that. And as they then try to apply those rules, uh, things get very, very confused. Uh, that may be an applicability statement issue, but it's probably not something we should ignore. All right, comments? I should add that I don't know how to fix it. I'm just identifying the problem. Well, um, there is. I, I switched to the second slide, and there is a bit uh, a part of the proposal how how to go about it. So I think which is fair. Um, so anybody else wants to? Yeah, that that uh, that um. That comment on the second slide is right, and I think that's one we can get our hands on. The various combinations of blanks and uh, and slashes within quoted strings, I'm uh, I'm more worried about in terms of uh, of not knowing of not knowing what the right solutions are. Uh, but I've seen some of this stuff in the wild um, uh, because in in. In one historical case, because that's what the operating system required, uh, because that was how usernames worked. Uh, but um, but more often in a uh, in a strange kind of security by obscurity sort of thing, because uh, the uh, the spammers don't know this co these combinations, spammers and fishers don't know these kinds kinds of combinations exist, and uh, and consequently putting them into a uh, uh, a mailbox name is a uh, is a way of keeping noise down, but I I don't think that's a very strong justification. Right, Pete was commenting in Java, saying hopefully how to fix doesn't include any changes to what its string syntax is fifty three twenty two. I think there is no proposal to change uh, syntax. Well, almost. Not. Uh, yeah, I th I think uh, that shouldn't affect fifty three twenty two. Yeah, I'm I'm I, I'm not sure. There there may be some syntax productions that we either need to change or we need to make some explicit statements about what what's equal and not equal to various other things. Uh, because the way these quoted strings get messed with, they uh, <clears throat> they may be an exception to the rule that uh, that nobody but uh, 
but the delivery server can figure it gets to figure out what an address means. Right. Um, so yeah, this is uh, sort of the second part of the proposal is saying that uh, if people yeah. want to com compare this, we need to say uh, probably be more clear about this. I'm sure there are lots of bugs in this area. So anybody else wants to talk about this? I know th uh, this issue is not very fleshed out, so maybe we'll, I'll try to do a straw man proposal on the mailing list and then everybody can hate it. It may be useful to separate those, uh, those two possible resolution paragraphs from each other, because the first one seems pretty obvious to me and it's reasonably well fleshed out. And the second one is hand-waving. Maybe important hand-waving, but at the moment hand-waving. Okay, um, do you think we need a separate issue for the second one? Or just, just if, go? If, if you want to get the first one resolved, then moving the second one is a separate issue is probably a good thing. Okay. It, dep it depends on how you feel about half resolved issues. Mm. Okay, if we can minute that, maybe create a second, um, second issue about comparison. Uh, that would be good. Right. Um, if there are no further comments on this, let's move on. Right, empty quoted string and 5322. Um, this is, we had a long discussion on this last time. Um, I think where we landed is uh, we shouldn't change syntax, but applicability statement need to talk about where it's okay and not okay to have empty quoted strings. Um, so I just wanted to um, have a bit of a feedback on uh, what might go into applicability statement. And this is the next slide. So this, um, yes, John. Pushing this to the AS is okay. We just need to make certain that we're sufficiently coordinated that uh, that five three two two uh, does not end up prohibiting anything that five three two one allows. Right. Yes. There is. There is that. Yes. Absolutely. Right. So, um, Pete. Um, given how much 5322 allows, it would be hard to imagine that anything 5321 would allow would not be in 5322. Um, th this makes me perfectly happy because it's less work for me, so you will get no objection from my end. All right, so um, looking at this slide specifically, and Pete, maybe you want, you want to stay online. Um, I did a bit of research about where quoted strings are allowed. Um, I think the obvious case where it's okay is display name in uh, name other uh, construction. I think uh, it's probably going to cause practical issue in local parts, probably in receive tokens and keywords. I don't know how many people are using keyboards, uh, but does this look roughly correct? And when I say cannot be empty, uh, that will go to applicability statement. So the syntax will allow it, but uh, we'll just add text saying that certain things are not a good idea.
I, I'm, I'm going to defer to anyone who might have operational experience here because all of these things seem perfectly reasonable, but I don't have a strong opinion. Do you think it will help to create some test messages and post them somewhere and ask people to, um, you know, use mail clients to display them and see if they crash and burn? See and what just... damage it does to their mail clients. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, we, we could do that. I, I, you know, we can do a little testing. I'm sure people would be amused. John? It seems to me, and, and this becomes entirely appropriate for the AS, but it seems to me that what a lot of this stuff is about is a uh, uh, is a warning that uh, that some of these constructions are uh, are not likely to work in in the general case, and uh, and if you create mailboxes that look like this uh, in in local parts and things like that. Um, that uh, that it's not going to work, and unless you uh, in the again in the general case and operationally, and if uh, if what you want is for it not to work in many cases because it's obscure and the security is deliberate, then that's a whole issue, a whole different issue. <clears throat> but uh, but I don't know how much else you can say about that, <clears throat> and uh, and of course the decision we made earlier moves the question of moves the receive token question about this into uh, into an A21 issue <clears throat> and uh, and Pete is correct that A22 permits uh, the 5322 permits almost anything that uh, that one can possibly imagine and maybe in this case that's okay The keywords keywords are particularly important here because the purpose of using keywords is to uh, <clears throat> is to have something which works and, and is comparable and uh, and if you use these things then it may not okay so it seems to, uh, that you are roughly agreeing with uh, preliminary analysis on the slide but obviously devil is in details yeah okay Braun? so um the one thing as i guess uh, an end user of this stuff is it would be nice to have guidance on this stuff is very likely to work and here be dragons don't mess around here so things like using empty strings or using lots of specially quoted stuff in your local part is likely to break things whereas if you stick within this set of characters and this set of behavior then you can expect everything to interoperate and at, it's really at the stage where you are then talking to whoever's receiving your email or sending your email or your providers up and downstream and saying to them, hey, you're not behaving properly. Here's what the RFC says, you should do this. Um, and we, we need to cut a line where we say, things in this area should be expected to work. Things in this area are, you're, you're playing in dangerous territory. And I think having, defining that edge somewhere is valuable and saying it's, it's just all undefined. You, anything might work, anything might not work, isn't useful to anybody. Um, right. so I'd like to see some kind of it. Here's, here's the things that are generally considered to be safe. Um, I think you, we're still, should, really we still do, do this in applicability statement. Yeah, um, but right. yeah, certainly having having a pretty strong uh, plus plus is expected in a local part. And if your web form doesn't allow someone to enter that, it's not accepting email addresses. But uh, double back quoted empty white space is not expected to work and if you make this your local part and it's not accepted in a web form then you get to keep both the broken pieces right okay thank you right moving on and changing um to something slightly different 
Um, this is an issue about closing connections, uh, ticket number 46, uh, and what the expected client behavior is. Um, so there was a suggestion that uh, to clarify on the assumption that the client will receive it after the next command is issued. Um, by uh, adding or read it before closing the connection at its side. Um, this text probably, now that I, I, I look at it, it probably can be improved, but um, comments, suggestions about this? Uh, I'll do whatever the working group decides it wants to do, but uh, but I'm still not convinced that there's a real problem here. And uh, uh, and if the working group decides that it wants changes, then I think we should put in something resembling a uh, uh, a specific example of a case where uh, where 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 this is relevant. Yeah, actually, I do have a slide showing how clients typically work. So if it helps people to sort of understand the issue, uh, I can flip to that. Barry, if you want to say something. Oh, wait to see your slide. Um, I think a non-blocking client is probably uh, the most obvious. So basically, the order of event is server rights, uh, four to one shutting down um, and close its side of the connection gracefully. Then client decides to send some commands at a later point. Um, and then it, this is uh, using non-blocking sockets. So the client use poll or ePoll on Unix or any other kind of similar um, event framework um, to wait for read and write events and close events. And uh, this will complete immediately and the client will get um the text sent by the server before it gets notified the connection got closed so actually client already have it in its tcp buffer the closing message from the server in some cases so um i think the suggestion behind the text was to, to make it clear that it, it's okay and maybe even a good idea to do this sort of thing not just uh, uh because the original text uh, seems to suggest that um, client will receive this information after sending a command, but actually the client has already received this information. Barry? So yeah, I'm I'm kind of with John. I don't um, I, I don't think the text really needs to be fixed here. I think uh, this is stuff for the applicability statement to um, discuss in more detail how clients should handle this. But that what's in 5321 now is okay. I think that. Um I haven't submitted this ticket. I'm just trying to proxy the, uh, whoever submitted it. I think the current text seems to be, uh, can be read as prohibiting this behavior where it's quite common actually in clients. I don't read the current text as prohibiting this. So if people think that, then yeah, maybe we do need to tweak the text. Anybody else? John? Barry, I don't read the current text as prohibiting this. This is a <clears throat> this is an operational detail about how the uh, the client behaves and your uh, your example is making a lot of assumptions about uh, how the client interacts with the TCP 
interface on a given machine, and that's uh, uh, that ought to be, I think, um, uh, sufficiently lower level to not be in scope for five three two one. But uh, uh, and and as I say, I don't think the text prohibits this. But if uh, if other people are reading his prohibition, then it ought to be patched. other hand, I don't think that the proposed fix patches it. I mean, I don't think it makes any difference. At least not in how I interpret the text. Yeah, I don't either. Right. Um, okay, and similar related issue is, again, I, I think it's a, the same, um, same type of issue in another paragraph. Um, whether the client can read what it already received uh, before interpreting it as four to one, in case the server sent a more specific other error, uh, response code. Um, It, it strikes me that we're trying to tell people how to deal with transport layer issues. And I understand that somebody writing an SMTP client might not understand how to deal with transport layer issues, but I'm not sure that 5321 is the right place to do that. Fine. Okay, so... Um, wrong? Do need to say about dealing with transport layer issues is when you should retry, when you should back off, um, when you should assume that the message went through. I think defining those really clearly is good. Um, otherwise, I agree with Barry. I agree that uh, saying when retries are appropriate is is definitely in scope for this. Yeah, I I, I agree with that, but. <clears throat> But, uh, but I completely agree with Barry's comment. We're, uh, we're really messing around in not, not only in transport layer issues, but in the issue of, of the local uh, communication between the client and the transport layer. And I don't think we want to go there if we can possibly avoid it. All right. Uh, let me try to have a follow up on this issue on the mailing list. Uh, if we can come up with some possible text for the applicability statement, we will. Uh, but at this point, it looks like no change for 5321. I'd be pretty hesitant about getting very far into this <clears throat> in the applicability statement as well. Again, because these are not only transport layer issues, but they're. Uh, there are issues in, in the local systems model, in, in the local systems, client systems model of how one interacts with the transport. And uh, uh, as I say, go, going there seems to me to be hazardous. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm looking at this. I'm just trying to figure out whether uh, documenting this makes a difference. And the uh, Hypothetical situation is if the server returns completely different error code, response code here, like 5xx, uh, but then we need to figure out, you know, is it going to affect uh, client no, I, I, behavior I think I basically. I think I understand where you're coming from and why, but, uh, but I also have memories of... Uh, of the time when we had uh, SMTP running over things besides TCP, and uh, and the possible situation in the future where, with the advent of uh, of non-TCP transport protocols, we may have SMTP running over uh, over non-TCP again, and uh, and getting way down into the issues of uh, of how TCP implementations. Uh, behave or appear to behave in a uh, in a given client environment uh, seems to me to be fraught with risks that we could clarify this in a way which makes things more difficult for uh, for future implementations in a way which we don't want to. 
So I, again, I, uh, <clears throat> uh, if we're going <clears> to <throat> do something here, I think it needs to be illustrated with specific examples, and I think we need to be very careful that we're not making more assumptions about the, uh, the transport layer than we need to. And, uh, and that's definitely true in, uh, in 5321 BIS. It is probably true even in the AS. All right. Uh, let me think how to approach this ticket. Uh, I I can completely understand that people fail to get excited about it. So. Um, oh, I'm excited about this. Just not excited what you'd like me to be excited. Well, I I have. Uh, I had similar coding issues, you know, trying to implement my client. That's why I'm trying to do a fair representation, trying to proxy uh, um, this issue. But anyway, moving on. Um, right. Okay. This. Right. Um, I think let's get some coffee in and. Uh, Talk about 552 walk around. Uh, Todd, are you happy to talk about this ticket? Sure. Um, the ticket, as I understand it, is discussing removing the bolded uh, sentence there. Um, clients should treat a 552 code in this case as temporary rather than permanent failure, so the logic below works. Um, there was some discussion on the list. Several folks posted uh, what they found in various open source packages. I believe that they all said that they treated 5.5.2 as a permanent failure. Um, I reached out to several large mailbox providers and a couple of commercial MTA vendors. Not everybody responded, but Google, Microsoft, and Proofpoint all said they treat 5.5.2 as a permanent failure. Um, so while the recommendation clearly says clients should treat it as temporary, it seems that most clients are not doing so. Um, so the question then becomes, do we leave this text in there and hope that people change their code or do we strike it? I'll open the floor to okay. John, so go ahead. Clarify. Um, as far as we know, no client is actually following this recommendation. Is this correct? I responded, right? Uh, yeah, I do not recall seeing any. I, I just reviewed the the thread that's called out in the ticket uh, a few minutes ago. I don't recall seeing any any mention in there that anybody was treating it as a temporary failure. Um, and I have not heard directly from anybody saying that they are treated as a temporary failure. Uh, I have not done an exhaustive um, survey of, of every possible MTA vendor out there, obviously, but um, right. I have not yet heard that any, anybody is treating it as a temporary failure. John? Uh, I posted a note to the list um, some hours ago uh, that uh, that suggests that not only is this statement not useful because nobody's paying attention to it, but it may be wrong. Um, so, uh, so that's a uh, probably an additional reason for getting rid of it. Okay, sounds good. Bron. Oh, Bron just removed himself. But Bron, if you want to. Okay. So maybe uh, I suggest maybe we have sort of like a mini working group last call on this issue, uh, asking for any objections, and then proposal is just to drop this sentence. Uh, right. Okay, moving on to the next one. Again, uh, for you, Todd. Yes. Um, 
this is another one where I've reached out to the same mailbox providers and commercial MTA vendors. I have not yet heard any responses back. They, they, get, they get to me when they get to me. Um, so the, I think definitely this warrants further discussion. Uh, those timeouts do seem, uh, to coin a phrase, from a different time. Uh, I think they are probably um, far longer than they need to be. But I think we need to get some actual verification um, from current implementations to see what they're doing before we um, go forward and make any changes here, because we don't want to we don't want to change day determination to say two minutes and then find out somebody is actually waiting ten minutes to do it. Uh, uh, but anyway, uh, Alexi, you're in the queue. And then, okay. John? Flag rather than it's an opinion, we should uh, should also reach out not just to uh, uh, things we consider ordinary email clients, but to the DTN people. Because uh, if the uh, if 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 the, if either the client or server is on the moon or on Mars and uh, uh, and the other one is uh, is earthbound. Uh, if it changes numbers, may or may not be appropriate. Um, again, um, not 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 opposed to making changes here, but if we're uh, if we're making decision on the basis of what uh, what implementations might do, then uh, uh, then DTN situations with uh, with pipelining may be something are are something we need to make certain we don't uh, mess up by accident. Does that make sense? John, do you have some specific, do, do you know who, who to contact on this? And I, are you happy to do that? Uh, not anymore. But I think I know who to ask, and his name is Surf. But there's still a DTN, but I think there's still a DTN working group, or... or yes, or there is. Yeah. And, uh, and that would be the logical place to start. All right, Bron. My question again in here is, is there any value in reducing the timeouts? Um, generally, if you're building a, a server that needs to deal with a lot of traffic, it can already spend very little resource, resources in holding open a TCP connection while it's waiting for things to happen down it. Um, what's the alternative, basically? Uh, why not leave them this big? And then that gives you more capability to deal with transient issues like high disk load or whatever on the receiving end. Yeah, that's perfectly valid. I, I, you know, if the intent here is to reflect reality, um, there may be need to change, but if the intent here is just to recommend values that, that cover the cases you're, you're, you're referring to, Bron, then Maybe leaving it as is, is is the right move. I think it's just further discussion, and and you know, reach out to the DTN folks and, and others to find out what they're doing right now to to try to inform that discussion. John, I just well, I think I heard the combination of uh, of of bronze, bronze comment and yours. Uh, Plus or minus adding in the uh, uh, the DTN question is that uh, we probably should not be looking at five three two one about this. We should probably be looking at uh, at how to construct a nice paragraph or two in the AS talking about the issues and the trade offs and what people are doing under various circumstances. But just a thought. Right. Um, yeah, it, it, I mean, I don't. The, the language in, in the spec right now says uh, the minimum per command timeout value should be as follows. So there are only recommendations. There's no, there's no um, 
stricture here with with, with them. Nobody can claim that you're violating uh, an RFC if you shut down, you know, after say three minutes instead of five, whatever. Um, so perhaps the applicability statement uh, is a better place to discuss this entire topic. We don't we have we don't have any any on list discussion of this topic or really anything in the ticket um, to to guide us yet. So let's um, I think just, just move forward with with further discussion on this and see where what the consensus emerges as to where where to take this. Ron. That there haven't really been any complaints about the current values, um, which to take us right back to those comments from ages ago, it, maybe we shouldn't be changing this at all because it's not an area that's causing problems with the current specs. That's fair. Uh, anyone else have anything to say on this topic? Okay. Well, Lexi, I'll turn it back to you. Yeah, I, I was actually optimistic. I didn't expect us to use um, two hours, but they're nearly there. I think that's the uh, last, uh, last issue that uh, I was really prepared to talk about, to be honest. So let's have a quick section for other other issues questions that people want to raise and um, if not then we'll finish a few minutes early going once going twice Okay, um, I think we're done then. Um, thank you all very much for showing up. And uh, I think we made some progress or at least uh, pointed out directions for various tickets. Uh, and we'll, uh, Todd and I will hope to see you on the mailing list and uh, get, get these documents done. So thank you all. Thank you. I'm, I'm less depressed now than I was when I started the meeting, which is rare. I'm very glad to hear that, John. I'm still waiting for my um, my vaccine. You know, because of my my age, I'm lucky if I get anything in April. Yeah, there have been a few advantages being old that. Uh have come up with this context there aren't very many other advantages yes i appreciate that all right i'll see you lovely people around thanks everyone